Halito. We don't bet they. Oh, see you. It's there. Hey, when we all win. See you. See you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Native Narrative. The future is indigenous. My name is Ashley Carter. I'm a graduate student here at Northeastern State University, and I am helping facilitate this podcast. Tonight, our host is Jessica Frazier, and um, she's going to lead us off with her topic. And here we go. As Ashley said, um, welcome to Native Narrative, the future is an indigenous. Um, my name is Jessica Frazier. Um, I'm this week's host. I'm very excited. Um, so this week, our topic is going to be how misrepresentation can impact our education in indigenous identity, um, especially as college students. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself and then everyone else can go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, so his J, Jessica Frazier, John Jeskados, and also Jessica Frazier, Watumka, Oklahoma Legados, I'm a Legado with Gogi, Mamanawi Dawa Ikeleji, Northeastern State University, Amahago Jogados. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Frazier. I am from Watumka, Oklahoma. I am currently a student uh, here at Northeastern State University. I am a social work student and I'm a senior. Um, I am Mississippi Choctaw, my tribal town is Kelegi, and my clan is Raccoon. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Um, so Sam, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Jess, and thank you for having us here. Um Sion the God, Sam Phillips Dawadonga, uh Gijala Gi, uh Janelle. Uh hello everyone. My name's Sam Phillips. I am Cherokee. I'm from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I am a senior as well at Northeastern State University and I'm uh, majoring in American Indian Studies with a focus on sovereignty, health, and current issues, and I'm also majoring in Legal Studies. She'e bilagana nishle do kia'ani bashish chin, bilagana dashiche do sinijani da shunale, akot ego atsa nishle, farina king yinish ye. So in Navajo, we introduce ourselves by our clans first. And I just introduced that um, I recognize my matrilineal side of the family, my mother, that I am um, of European American descent on my mom's side, primarily of English American ancestry. And then we acknowledge our paternal family uh, still through the mothers and the mother's clans, but I am, and, and I am born for the towering house people and the black streaked woods people of the Dene, as we call ourselves, the people in Navajo Nation. And my name is uh, Farina King. I'm a assistant professor of history and I focus on Native American and Indigenous histories, especially in the 20th century. I am an affiliate of the Cherokee and Indigenous Studies Department at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. It's something that I've certainly thought a lot about. I've lived in a lot of different places in the Washington DC area for um, many years, but other parts and also Navajo Nation. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed meeting diverse peoples from around the country and thinking about this question of Indian mascots. And I look forward to talking about it with you, with you all, especially with the recent um, news and developments of the change of the NFL Washington team that I, you know, was the team nearby where I lived in the DC area. Ahiehe wado. All right, thank you all for being here. I appreciate y'all taking y'all's time out of y'all's day. Um, and sitting down and having this conversation. Um, so first question, what is the general history of Indian mascots? Um, or what are the key arguments for or against mascots? Oh, um, thanks for already bringing up these questions. And I mean, 
some aspects of that history. It's actually a very complicated history of Indian mascots and the way that I think of it, have been thinking about it lately, is it's a part of a series of colonialism. And colonialism, people can cringe at that term or it's very loaded, it's a lot of ideas, but let's just get to the basic idea of colonialism because this is the umbrella. It's a part of um, all the mega dynamics that Indian mascots are a part of is that to colonize a place, right, is that you have a, a group, a certain group that seeks to um, establish and build up their center and they're going out and extracting from areas or planting themselves there and they're reaping and, and it's setting up a power dynamic and a structure that in many ways to me, it's like vampirism. And that's what I've talked about a lot. And, and there's a number of scholars who have, have examined colonial dynamics, of course, especially in indigenous communities, the work of Patrick Wolf that describes colonialism as a process, not just you know, a certain event. Uh, different scholars who examine this, um, Linda Smith of talking about the needs of even the ways we talk about uh, these indigenous histories and aspects, how we need to decolonize those methodologies, or Jennifer Nez Danette Dale, um, different scholars who, again, try to see and understand history, understanding these processes of colonialism and how they are intertwined with different issues, such as Indian mas mascots and what we're talking about today. And why I call it a vampirism is right vampires a, a being that lives off of the lifeblood of another they like suck it and it, it's about taking and and absorbing that life source to build yourself so with indian mascots where this comes in and where people don't like to draw these connections but i hope that's where we get to today is that um when you have you know, this history of conquest of groups of people coming from different parts of the world, but specifically Europe and Western Europe, and most people affiliate, right, the English colonies, they think of that, um, and the early wars, right, the Thanksgiving myth that people remember of, of um, Europeans interacting with this group called Indians, right, a misnomer there that, that's embraced. And then um, the, a clash that eventually happens, but we also don't really talk about they might talk about that in terms of wars and battles but what was that what were those clashes over right what happens in those encounters is people are struggling and fighting over land that you had bas basically indigenous people who this is their homeland this is where they live and then they're encountering this outside force of intruders of conquerors coming in and saying nope we claim this land we're going to be in charge of it we're going to extract this um, from it and then this will be ours, we will absorb it. So what becomes of those people who had their own sense of, of peoplehood and who they are it is, are they conquered peoples? Do they become colonized peoples? These are questions that are raised, but certainly they, they are subjugated in, in this history, especially of waves of this influx that, that first begins with Europeans, but it transforms into the United States after the American Revolution, and the United States then becomes a colonizing force. And this is something in our history of the United States that we aren't even openly naming on this basic level, that the United States colonizes. We don't even talk about it in that term, on those terms. And why that matters with Indian mascots is that it goes back to that history of the United States um, basically claiming and absorbing and, uh, you know, in, in instances of vampiring, <laughs> sucking in the lifeblood of these areas, but then absorbing it into their own. And a part of claiming these lands and even the peoples of their, of, as a part of the United States is um, putting, naming, putting names on these places that they, that they conquer, that they control, that they absorb, and also claiming and controlling the images of those first peoples that they confronted. And if you mythologize it, if you create a romantic narrative 
right, with um, James Fenimore Cooper and the last of the Mohicans. If you let people believe that um, Native Americans are just these blanket, and they literally use that term in the past too, the blanket Indians, like they blanket over these, all these diverse peoples, their rich languages, their knowledge, their culture. And if you just stamp an image on it and say, well, they were an Indian, they were there, yes, they were the first peoples, and in, as, as in the last Mohicans, they create these portrayals and images of Indians as either the noble or the savage, right? But they are romanticized. They become like uh, a fairy, a fictionalized story, and, and a part of this American myth. Some might call it an empowering origin story of the United States, but they just become a, like a myth, a fairy tale. And Indian mascots, it makes perfect sense because what is a mascot? It's like a lucky charm. It's like, you have dragons can be mascots or animals, but it's like a spirit animal almost where it's for fun. It's, it's taking an item and, and dehumanizing it in a sense, even if there are other mascots that are like the Vikings, the fighting Irish, right? And I have some concerns with those too, but whatever way that these mascots are used in sports or for schools and in different ways, um, it is controlling and using that image um, in a way that is dehumanizing. You know, they're not human. They're, it's like a subhuman thing, even if people want to say, well, it's honoring, we're proud, we're cheering with it, but it's for fun. And when you're taking a, a whole people and categorizing them and blanking them as such, that, that it's all intertwined, it's entangled with those dynamics of the legacy of colonialism and those power structures that form to basically when you control a people you control their image you control how they're remembered or how they're forgotten you know they're, they're being forgotten and, and um, the history of them distorted and where most of these mascots came up um, at least big ones you might hear of like Cleveland Indians what um, Ashley was referring to with the big football teams, national um, leagues, such as uh, the R word, right? The Nat Washington team. And I say R word because why are we, why were these terms even normalized? Terms that began with referring to the genocide with these colonial, with these colonizing processes, what it often came to were intrusions on indigenous lands and those uh, and the history of settlers who made choices of basically we want the land at whatever cost and that means natives were seen as in the words of Cherokee scholar and writer Thomas King his book the inconvenient Indian is natives were seen as inconvenient in the way and so they had to be removed one way or another and that often was uh, different forms of genocide, a way of wiping out their people, even if it is, you know, oh, they can live, but we'll just absorb them as, as Americans. You have to detribalize them. You have to eradicate that specific meaning of, of their indigeneity, those intricacies of their culture and who they are. And Indian mascots, that is enabling that process of, you know, dehumanizing, detribalizing, um, homogenizing Native Americans so that when people say, oh, I know what an Indian is, I know who Indians are, they look like the Blackhawks, the image of that team, or they look like that, that Indian mascot with the Braves, you know, or whatever it is, that's what's coming to their mind. So a lot there, but I, I did want to say with the history of it, um, a lot of those teams came up in the early 20th century, but it goes into series. Like even before a lot of those teams were formed, the process of taking over native names and romanticizing them in novels in the 19th century, things like that, these happened in waves of, of following these processes of um, colonizing, conflict, clashes, and then taking over, um, trying to control these images and appropriating them of Native people. Thank you, Dr. King. Sam, with all that being said, do you think um, there's a link between mascots and how Natives are portrayed in mainstream media? Um, thank you, I, I definitely do. You know, and as Dr. King was saying, it really goes back to the history of how 
um, you know, the very first explorers and the very first settlers displayed natives, right? So when we're talking about colonization and we're talking about, you know, writing history or giving an image of anyone for any reason, we have to ask those questions of why were they doing it? Who was benefiting from it? And what was their goal, right? So um, when we talk about mascots, if we really dig deep, like Dr. King was saying, we'll see that, you know, a lot of the times it was to cover up something else that was going on to kind of shift focus away from whatever that policy change was to sh to kind of i guess pull the pull the wool over people's eyes about what was really going on right so when we think about that we really look at um mainstream media as a whole and we can see these waves as she was talking about and that we can see the aligning government policies that went with them. And ultimately what we see is exploitation through media, right? And ultimately if we're watching football, if we're watching basketball, whatever, we're doing that for entertainment, that's media unless you're involved in the sport, right? So, um, and then merchandising all of that, that goes back to media. So it's all intertwined. And when we really look back at it, whether it be, you know, 200 years ago and it's the carnival coming through town and the guy peddling his Indian elixir with the chieftain head on it, or it's, you know, renaming a university that has its roots in colonization, right? I mean, that's, that's definitely a conversation. It's a hard conversation being students here because we love our school and we love, you know, our community, but we really have to address that as well, right? Uh, ultimately, our school was founded in colonization. The school was started as the Cherokee Female Seminary after statehood, which shouldn't have happened because it was taking away our land again, right? Then NSU purchased the school from the Cherokee Nation. And then up pops the mascot to honor those people. But really, what are we doing? We're not honoring people, we're taking from them. So when we take, when we take for our own benefit, that's not honoring, that's exploitation. So when you really look at mascots or any type of, you know, media image, you know, the Lando Lakes lady, all of those different things, we're really talking about the exploitation of Native people. And when, you know, you have the question of whether or not that's harmful, well, think about it. You're taking an image that you think you know what it's about or an image you saw once and you're misappropriating it and you're benefiting from it and you're making money off of it. Meanwhile, the actual policy 90% of the time in American history has said, you can't be an Indian. So that's plain and simple exploitation. And we see it all through mass media, mainstream media. You know, if you Google Native American, odds are the first hundred or so images are all going to be of the stereotypical headdress, war bonnet, you know, and that's not who we are. So it pushes this pan-Indian image and tries to get rid of who we are as individual sovereign peoples. Uh, so it becomes very toxic very quickly. It becomes very um, harmful very quickly. And people don't realize that because by ripping us of our identity, of stripping us of that, you're stripping us of our sovereignty. And, um, you know, that's one that we've talked about before of, uh, you know, the late Wilma Man Killer used to say that public perception drives public policy. So if public perception of what they see in the media of, you know, Indians being mascots just for pleasure and to root for, for their basketball team on the weekend, or Indians being the bad guy in the movie, well, that's not a real person. So why do I care about what's happening them happening to them when it comes to law and the government, right? So I think that there is definitely a huge connection between the two. 
and that having those conversations about that specific link is what is needed for people to understand and start seeing us as an actual people again. Thank you, Sam. How can we as students address the mental impacts of misrepresentation that's going on within our education on campus? Um, like you said, we were, you know, we were a mascot that did not represent Indigenous people. It, it was a mascot that did not honor us. And so how can we go about um, healing when that's right in our, right on our campus and right in our community? I know for me, trauma is a huge thing. And it's come from the boarding schools. It's come from, like Dr. Dr. King said, you know, colonialism. It's it's all connected, like, you know, like, like we've all been saying, it's all connected. Um, but generational trauma is especially big. Um, I know for me being in this institution as a student, I'm always surprising myself. It's, being, you know, being on this podcast, this opportunity right now is surprising to me because I'm just that little poor girl that came from the little poor community that, you know, had to, I had to go to the bathroom outside, I had to bathe outside, I had to do a lot of things outside. And so I'm looking at myself in a position that I'm not supposed to be in. Um, and so it's really hard, um, you know, the mental impact, my mental health is something that is big. And how, how, can, we, how, can, how can we heal when we're in an institution that was supposed to harm us and that is essentially harming us still because we don't have these proper representations. Um, there's still there's still a wall on our campus that still honor still honors quote unquote uh, that mascot because it's important to the institution rather than the mental health of indigenous students and staff and the community. And it's it's really it's harmful and I wish others could sit down and have these conversations with us and react and we could see their body language and because that's all important to to all of us it's you know we have to respect one another um, but taking care of one another is really important and I'm really glad that Northeastern State has this has this opportunity for its students to speak out and use their voices um, I'm glad we have this in Virtual Studies I'm glad we have the Native American Sports Center it's it's all incredible, but you know what happens when we go outside of our community, and we're trying to adjust to a place that is inherently not for us. But yeah, how can we as students, you know, what are what are the impacts of those misrepresentations within our own education? It's it's, it's important to acknowledge. You know, we need native therapists on campus because they're, you know non-natives they're not going to understand what generational trauma is they're not going to understand that experience and so these students are being left out because there there's no native therapist and these are these are all important and i hope that one day this can be this doesn't need to be a conversation that should be had but you know right now it should be and i'm glad we're doing this and it's really exciting to me I really appreciate you sharing that, you know, if you're even sharing your own perspective of we, when we're talking about from a very unique position here of being at Northeastern State University, um, there's these references, right, that we've already heard to the history of our institution that we were founded by the Cherokee Nation, one of the first schools, you know, to have, um, to have that background of, of a tribal nation, not a federal government developing that boarding school. <clears throat> and then um, that Cherokee were trying to shape and design their own education um, and for women as well as men. Then you have the waves of American forms of colonialism, which is allotment and um, assimilationist policies 
including in education, and different tribal nations, including the Cherokee, the ones known as the civilized tribes, or you know the five tribes, as people call them, they tried to um, strategize and appropriate, you know, even themselves find safe spaces to protect their sovereignty, how to continue that. So it also is intricate, depending on which tribal nation and community we're talking about. And if we even just look at ourselves here at NSU and this particular dynamic, how do we unpack that, you know, to from that point to here? And what I found really interesting in my research is that um, when you had in these power dynamics, a key part of it is who gets to define a people, who gets to define their values, their images, what sells, what doesn't sell, you know, what is what is considered popular, mainstream, um, the, a hegemonic force, if you will. And in terms of where the Cherokee found themselves at that point with education, is sometimes, and not, and this is not just Cherokee, but I find this among our own, uh, among many diverse Native peoples today, is is they are told. This is what is sanitary, like these are sanitized images that are kosher of Native Americans. And, and that gets at what Sam was talking about earlier of uh, you have Native religious practices and spiritual practices, languages that are being banned and saying, no, 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 you can't be that kind of Native. That, you know, you can't define and self-determine what what native you are this this is what a native is or or when it's romanticized in place if you um if you try to secularize like you take it out of its sacred meaning even and now everyone can wear a headdress you wear it to the parties that's what the mascot wears you know they're running onto a big football field while everyone's drinking beer and whatever, and you do that anywhere, that's, that's the Indian image. That's what an Indian is. You're taking it out of what does a headdress mean? Where did that come from? What it means to Lakota people, to Oyete people, right? Of, of the sacredness of that. And so that how even not just um, general Americans that affects, but that's feeding our own children, right? This expectation of, of where um, different Native peoples, they're then appropriating that, they're embracing that to try and navigate, to, to survive, to thrive even, you know, to try and navigate um, these, these uh, different terms, the terms of the game, so to speak, right? The terms of what, what the world, how, how it's running, the hierarchies, the functions and different things there. So what I mean by that is what I was shocked by in my studies and even shocked by, by my own children who go to school in this area. And even the school that I, I you know, that I work, the schools, because I work with and collaborate with different schools that I work with, what I see is this perpetual cycle that is tied to those initial waves of, of colonialism and that history that we think that's past, that's the history, right? That's what you want to say, but the cycles are there. And where it comes out, is I find in the early um, 1900s, for example, there are Native Americans playing Indian that we also have like from Phil Deloria's work of playing Indian, Boy Scouts of America, different Americans, the Boston Tea Party, they were playing Indian, right? And people dress this on and, and the mascots have also led to that when there's Indian mascots, even people with the chopping, tomahawk moves when they're cheering, you know, they're doing that, they're playing Indian. Right. And, and why are they doing that? But we even find that some of our own native children, they are cut off from what it means to be in my for my family's right. Dene. What does it mean to really be Dene? What does it mean to be Cherokee? What does it mean to be of, of this tribal nation or this different group? And they're being cut off from their elders and that those traditional ways of knowledge and that they uh, self-determined. And, and I think teachings of dignity, of, of that self-respect. And they're being fed, well, this is what it means to be Indian, you know, play around with the tomahawk and, and that's inciting these histories of where natives are portrayed as savage, warlike, right? 
and even some native groups that that they appropriate that that they do that in their own schools and even communities that should know better where we're in an area i, I let me tell you places i've lived including in dc people met me and they said you're native american i thought they were all extinct and i've had people say that to me in different areas including where supposedly you know with the washington team but before the name was changed and removed people were arguing well it's honoring natives this is how people will know them and they will honor and remember them well be, let me tell you i lived in that area and people had no idea about natives they were not honoring us that it was not helping it was worsening it it was perpetuating it and people couldn't even recognize and see me as native because natives in their minds they have this illusion that natives cannot live today they cannot be live thriving and living beings who can change but also be tied to that history and that connection right and so that's something that i faced as a child is i know i was fed that too and i'm glad you you brought that up jessica of like watching disney's pocahontas i thought like that was my introduction to native american history but that didn't even have that was not my people's history that wasn't my ancestor stories and disney was totally messing it up anyway, you know, if, oh, she did not hook up with John Smith like that. She never married him, right? All these different um, offshoots there. And, and then I worry about my own children that in their schools, they're still being fed these images from Indian mascots that they're perpetuating. And they live in a school where they can go to the Cherokee Heritage Center, the Cherokee Museums. Um, they have access to so many great resources here with community. And that's what they're learning in the schools where there's a strong presence in our area, a strong presence of Native American population, where it's like, we should know better, but we're still latched onto this. It's still got a hook over us. So I think the biggest thing is what you're doing now is come to that awakening, though people are scared of it because they wonder, well, what does this imply? What does this do? But that's shaping the future, having a better future for our children, um, being a part of bringing this up to education and curriculum, um, talking to educators, those who make these decisions, help influence um, the kind of images, the way we talk about it in books, and uh, share your opinions out there. I'm really proud of our Native students that not only are you doing this podcast, but people are writing to our local news. They're submitting to the Telequa Daily Press. They are getting the word out there so that they're showing you're not alone, feeling like you're in a vacuum by yourself, but also talking with your peers, being a voice where I used to be shy. I used to think, I don't want to talk about a controversial topic. No, they're going to, you know, shut me down. Or I worried, I don't have anything to say. But that's the biggest part too. Learn, learn for yourself. Look for these sources, have these kind of conversations. There's amazing work um, that uh, Debbie Reese has done in terms of American Indian children's literature, even basic uh, lessons of what are we, what are we having our children look at, which we went through ourselves of what were we being exposed to. And it, it kind of sticks in our head and how do we, you know, how do we unpack that? How do we um, rewrite we need to unerase Dina Gillio Whitaker. Thank you. Um, we need to unerase these indigenous histories because it's like they were covered up to try and suppress that knowledge, suppress what does it mean to be native, to control it, to also exploit it. Take if you sanitize it and you commodify it the way you want, then it then it feeds that the you know the vampire of colonialism that that continues right. And if you try to erase it or control it, well, how, what do we do when we can unerase that? And then open that up and say, well, this is actually what happened. This is actually who we are. Um, and I, I think, you know, both of you have touched on quite a bit of that question. You know, what do we do? How do we heal from that? Um, and it does ultimately come down to us because nobody's going to change it but us right um saying i'm i'm done i'm done right and our older our older generations our elders you know they 
they had to do what they had to do to survive. And a lot of that led into this uh, mentality of forgive and forget, or just don't talk about it and move on, right? Um, but then you get into that generational trauma and you get into those unaddressed feelings and the things that are still being presented today in our own classrooms and um, you know the impact of that, right? So you have different studies, you know, full-fledged medical studies of how these portrayals and these depictions affect Native students, you know, and, um, you know, as we've talked about before, Stephanie Freiberg is an awesome research, resource to look at what she's done, what she's studied, but there is definitive proof that she, you know, that she has that shows when Native children are introduced to these images, their image about themselves just decreases, you know, their confidence decreases, they start to question their own identity and these things. And I feel like our generation, though we are still feeling those effects and struggling with how to fix it within ourselves, we also are far enough removed from the personal boarding school experience to stand up and say, I will stand in that gap and I will put a stop to this. And I think that, you know, finding those friendships on campus and if you have something like the Native American Support Center or the Center for Tribal Studies of really tapping into those and building those networks because, you know, we talk about code switching with children from different communities and, you know, going into class and having to speak the way you're taught to speak and think the way you're taught to think and then being able to go somewhere and just be yourself is vital, you know, and you know, finding that one or two, maybe three uh, professors on campus that actually get it, right? Um, like Dr. King, we're so fortunate to have her because she creates that safe space for us. We don't have to walk into her class and worry about, you know, reading a book that calls us some derogatory word. Um, and then her justifying it because she would never do that. She understands. Um, but I think it does take us coming together and having those hard conversations and saying, you know, this is scary, but I don't want my kids to feel this way. So I think that, um, you know, it's, it's our responsibility as this generation to take up that work and really start to advance our position and how people see us. And, um, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Kutcha, Risling Baldy, um, in a book that we read for one of Dr. King's classes, actually, um, she talks about not just reclaiming, but rewriting our own histories and that we have to be the ones to do that, right? You can't just reclaim something. You have to retell it from your own perspective for people to see who you are. Um, until we do that, how are they gonna see us for people when, you know, the majority of the nation doesn't think we're still around? I think that's a good thing to bring up is reclaiming um, and talking about mascots, um, you know, Sequoia Indians. Um, we didn't call ourselves Indians. <laughs> we, we didn't call ourselves Indians. Um, so how can we reclaim that word when it wasn't even ours to begin with? Um, and so that's, that's an important conversation to have, especially throughout, you know, this, this community right here in Tahlequah. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's important to have um, because 500 plus tribes exist within within the United States. Um, and th those aren't Indians. <laughs> those are those are Cherokees, those are uh, those are Choctaws. Um, those are all different types of people with different beliefs and different values. And it's these mascots are not okay. These mascots, whether our own people, the people think we're that's a way to honor us, it's not. Um, 
our representation is us and it's standing as us on our own and with our own beliefs and it's standing as 500 plus tribes 500 different people um, it's never standing as one because you know as a community we we don't even a lot of us don't think of ourselves as having a higher position than the next um, but rather it's the whole community that has a voice and no voice will ever be higher than the next and i think that's a value that a lot of us tend to forget and you know that that's okay um, because we've gone through these issues and we've gone through all this you know all this bull to be standing right where we are and whether we're looking at it as a person you know me having this generational trauma and trying to heal through it and try to go through it um it's important it's important to know your history and not the history that comes from the books but the history that your that your community and your family is telling you because our community is very important you know we have you know cherokees you know gadugi is really important and yeah, that's something that i've really enjoyed listening to um my my cherokee friends um they they really <laughs> they really value that and it's something that can be seen throughout nask and cts and i wish and i hope that through this conversation we can realize that you know we're still a community whether someone disagrees with you know our our perspective on the mascots um but we're still a community and we need to come together and it's important to have these conversations it's important to have these conversations on campus in our organizations um at work you know as respectful as it can be um and throughout our families especially with our families because there can be that aunt there can be that that grandma that mom that is like what are you doing um it, it it really is important to have these conversations and so i'm glad that you all are here and that you are sharing your perspectives um it's really important um you know as a student as a professor you're just you being you is important and I hope you know that, and I hope everyone who listens to this knows this. Um, you know, you're you're valuable, you're knowledgeable, and you know, you're staying on your own, whether you're a student or you're a professor or you're just, you know, a, a tribal member. But none of that is just just if that makes sense. You know, you you represent more than you think you know. And it's really important. But I'm really glad we got to have this conversation today. Me too. Thank you for asking us to be here. Yeah, I I feel like there is so much, so much to talk about this. I mean, look at, there's so many materials now. And what does give me hope is that even in like US Today on, on public journalism and, and conversations, you see the work that Amanda Blackhorse, her voice, um, Twitter, uh, Susan um, Harjo, and Oh my gosh, so so many others, uh, Susan Schoen Harjo, who have who have paved the way, who have really worked hard in, in these ways and, and been trailblazers and and also pay respect to our elders and understand that like these changes are not a slap in the face to them. I think sometimes we have generational differences of what are the what are the battles we are facing and the struggles we are facing? But I think in many ways, I, I look to my elders, even my parents' generation, and I'm so grateful for what they went through um, so that I can be where I am today. And some people, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and we have different stories of 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 our families and and where we come from but but you're doing that you can do something for your children of face the struggles that you can to have a better future for them and i think at nsu you know that the um there's a number of issues with monuments and for institutions across the country to be accountable that we are supposed to be um you know beacons of education examples and what more can we do to examine our own history and the own, our own um, efforts to decolonize and be accountable 
for the ties that our community has to dispossess of marginalizing other people, even through mascots. And our institution, after it did become a state-run school, as Sam explained, uh, you know, that process, that history there, part of it, it's, it's pretty deep, um, is it did have an Indian mascot. And that change was more top-down and not really from the community. So there's still people who are very sensitive and sore about this. And Oklahoma still has many Indian mascots. And as mentioned, Sequoia, um, which is a American Indian school of native students, um, still has an Indian mascot. And when I came to Oklahoma in, and started to live here in 2017, there was a, a very um, controversial episode with the Fort Gibson School and a homecoming float where students who were identified even as Native American, as Cherokee or in, in these different ways, um, they dressed up plain Indian, as I was talking about, and had a float saying, and call, had a call saying, cage the Indians against their rivals, right? And that to me, just again, it's a sign that so much needs to be done, that there were adults there who didn't see that's not right, you know, didn't stop it from, you know, didn't review that or that students, where did they learn that? Where did they learn that that's okay to, you know, dehumanize and, and treat the mascot as it is a mascot, it sets you up for that. And so it's, it's a wake up call for us to address these concerns and not wait for the next incident, you know, to explode, right? But realize that it's every day normalizing these images and it's like everyday forms of violence. Even if we don't see it as such a, is this an emergency? Is this urgent? There's so many other troubles in the world. People are starving. People are suffering in all these different ways. Um, but this is interconnected to it because just as Wilma Mankiller emphasized is we can't address living natives and their issues with the health disparities, even in COVID-19, you know, people don't understand why my people, the Navajo nation are being hit so hard is they're often a forgotten people, to be honest, who have been continually hit by impacts of uh, colonialism where money and making profits are prioritized over human lives. And I can say this, talking about my own family and our experiences of some of my relatives who you know, are exposed to water contamination, uh, different forms of radiation because of uranium mining and, and developments and where their water and access to water and food are not available to them. And it also traces to the history of violent removal where our people were dispossessed from their lands and their livelihoods in traditional ways um, targeted for extermination. And these are different forms of extermination. So an Indian mascot is like a symbol of saying this is a stamp of approval of that, that we're not dealing with. It's like a point of distraction is yeah, we're celebrating Indians. They're so cool, wearing headdresses, living in teepees, but not actually knowing or understanding the, the lived realities and experiences of native peoples who don't fit that box, who don't fit that stereotype. And to see us, just see us for who we are and how we are on campus. So I hope you know we continue this conversation with our institution that it's not just, oh, that was a change that was top down, but how do we get everyone to really understand what this means and that we can have a, have a brighter future. It's not erasing what happened in the past or that people were living in their circumstances with what they knew, what they were taught, but that we can know better now. <laughs> we can know more and grow and um, be able to have positive changes, but still have those ties to our traditions that, that also are positive of there were good people who did great things, um, you know, and aren't, it's not always like black or white of this is all bad, this is all good, 
you know, I, and what I mean by that is that there's ways to just respect people's of all times and all places. And it just begins with a simple point of asking, is this, is, is, is this hurting the people? Is somebody hurting from this? And can I stop it? And I want to leave you with my moment of awakening about mascots was I was in graduate school and um, in many ways, mascots were normalized in my family. My father had a very uh, tough childhood in many ways. He was blessed and fortunate to have uh, loving parents who cared for him, but there were issues of, you know, alcoholism, different struggles, diabetes rampant in my family, cancer, poverty, what people would, would see in those ways. Um, and I think my father dedicating his life to Indian health, that's been his mantra, you know, is that he's trying to save native lives the most he can. And we would get into debates about Indian mascots because he thought, well, you know, that's, that to me, I agree that it needs to change, but we have other priorities we need to face. And I said, well, it doesn't have to be exclusive. It's not either or, it's actually interconnected. And talking to him and other people about this have helped me to articulate it. And I hope it helps you all, is it's not like we have to, you know, have either or, or um, even it doesn't actually take much what people don't realize to just vocalize and show that this, that, that we're sharing that this is no longer acceptable to have Indian mascots and it's time for change. And when I was in graduate school, I heard an individual, Mark Denning, and I recommend look up his story. But this was an individual with Marquette University where they had an Indian mascot and he shared his story of how he literally like sold his likeness where he was their mascot and he let them, you know, take an image of him. And he said he was really into it. He believed in it and thought, well, this is the way that they're going to get it right is they'll use me as their Indian mascot and, and I can be that for them. But then he, he remembered he went to the university bookstore and he saw his image that they used as, as the um, image for their warriors or, or whatnot. And his face was like on underwear, he was being sold on all these things. And that's where he realized like, is it that they're making fun of native image? Like this isn't, this isn't a matter of, you know, honoring us and this is, like he just knew that wasn't right. Like he is being exploited there and he's a part of even exploiting his own image. Like he's selling his own in image away and just accepting that it can be on underwear or whatever, you know? And now he's become a major advocate for sharing his experiences, sharing how it's time to move away, you know, from that kind of exploita exploitation and saying that that's no longer okay. And that, you know, exploitation, it's a form of colonialism and its impacts and legacies that we can still see. And there are many of us, we come from all different backgrounds. We can be very different people who, who like I said, I have white settler descent as a part of me. I'm also part white. But something that I know many cultures and, and as Americans, you know, even just people who are in these same circles and spaces, Let's learn civility. Let's learn, let's really uphold what it means, what equality means. What does freedom mean? And what does like mutual respect mean in these aspects? And if we already have a past that makes people feel guilty or ashamed in any way, why are you feeling that? When that wasn't you and it doesn't have to be you. And you can say, as Sam said, it stops with you, that you're going to uphold, you know, those values and really not have it be like partially exclusive. Well, these people are in the in club. I'm going to include them and I'm going to respect them. But actually these people, they're not human. They're subhuman or something like that. And that's what Indian mascot still feeds is that there's these hierarchies of how certain peoples can be regarded and treated. And that's affecting us. Uh, I know in previous conversations we had, right, with the Indian Child Welfare Act and different issues of 
are, are um, even Black Lives Matter, those kind of intersections of um, race issues. And that's what I want to acknowledge too, is it's a lot of because, it's because of these conversations we're having about race and respect for human life and honoring what it means to really honor a life is that when you know you're doing something that hurts the people, hurts their image, stop it. You don't have to do that. And Halloween's coming around the corner. So have that in your mind too. People say, this is just having fun. I'm having fun. But no, they don't understand that when they're dressing up like that, you're making fun of another people. And even when you're a child, hopefully your mother taught you or someone taught you who you respect, you shouldn't be making fun of another people because that's the first step of how you dehumanize them. And then you won't even acknowledge that they're dying and suffering because of some of these policies that are happening that contaminate another people's water, that you know, extract and take resources from them and exploit their labor or they just are these different aspects. So yes, it is interconnected. And I, I see like connecting those dots in my life. It's um it's been a a real big journey for me. And I'm glad you all care about this conversation that many people have and they're starting to understand it. But I know there's a lot of people, even within our own tribal nations and community, I've written an op-ed in our Navajo Times recently. Um, you know, so please look those up that it, it is sensitive because people will say, well, what about, you know, the natives who say they're okay with it, they sign off with it. But it's just like my friend, that that individual who woke me up in a lot of ways brought me brought awareness to them for me mark denning look up his story i mean that's basically he signed that they use his image and he probably got something in return for that but is it worth it in the end is it really worth it what you are sacrificing what you're paying for in that and think about our generations ahead and how it's affecting all our generations so i know that's very difficult because there are communities that rely on those kind of funds, but it's time to say, no, they shouldn't have to rely on that. You don't have to rely on that anymore. Let's, let's find ways to figure this out and find new ways and more holistic ways of supporting our people, supporting the education of indigenous peoples who for so many years have been hit and targeted by these waves of colonialism. So thank you, as I said, I'm happy to always talk about these issues, even when they're hard, they're hard to talk about. So thank you for listening. I guess a final thought for now, or maybe more of a request than a final thought. Um, I know as far as my cultural teachings and how I was raised was to, to the best of my ability, um, acknowledge that interconnectedness right between everyone every living being every plant every animal everything right but to really do that in this modern time um i think we have to look a little bit further at the interconnectedness of literally all things so yes there are countless issues in indian country right now right and we say indian country and all that because unfortunately american indian is the legal term but um when we really look at everything broadly whether it be health um you know missing and murdered indigenous uh women and and people it's it's all connected and when we look at how we're portrayed through these mascots and through media and how that allows people to treat us or realistically how it allows them to erase us and forget us then we really need to look deeply at the interconnected interconnectedness of that and how the invisibility of our communities that erasure that these images have created that when you ask someone what is an indian or what is a native american they say oh, i've never met one or um you know they it just described you know that pan indian image that the media puts out they they don't see us so they don't see jess they don't see dr king they don't see me as a person as a native american as cherokee as dene you know it's they just think this far off thought of that cowboys and indians movie and those people don't exist anymore 
And by them believing that we don't exist, that allows them to not care when the government comes to take even more away and to continue to oppress us. So I think, you know, there's definitely a lot more that we can talk about in regard to that and how it's interconnected. But the only thing that I would ask of people is really look at that interconnectedness and how it's affected your life. Does the average person know that you're Native American or do they assume that you're assimilated and you're white? You know, and if that's the case, why? Is it because you're afraid to talk about your culture? Is it because your culture has been so far erased or taken away from you that you don't know where to connect and learn? What is that? There are all of these different questions that we really have to ask ourselves if, you know, five to seven generations from now, we're still going to actually exist, not theoretically, right? So that, that's my biggest thing for today and kind of that final request that I'll leave everyone with is, you know, look up those stories read the research, check out Stephanie Freiberg's research, check out uh, the Reclaiming Native Truth project through illuminatives.org and you know, really dig into what these problems are and how they're all interconnected to how we're seen as individuals and how we're seen as you know, native communities and tribal nations and you know, sovereign nations because that's not how they see us as a whole. Although. Thank you, Sam. Um, so I think one thing that I would want to leave with everyone um, is look into your own community, look into your campus, look into your families because change, even the smallest change is change. And you know, your family, your auntie, your, your grandma, someone with, you know, someone with these thoughts. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to be that person to say something. And, you know, it's, it's a no. No is the biggest, biggest uh, resistance that you can say. And I encourage everyone to say no. Um, you know, um, we talk about all these things. And it's, as Sam said, as Dr. King said, these are all connected. Our issues are connected. And, you know, these issues, I, I encourage everyone to look at them. You know, I encourage everyone to look at the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic that is going on right now. I encourage everyone to look at the colorism issue that is going on. I encourage everyone within the Tahlequah and Northeastern State community to look at the statue that sits um, at the park and look at the history of it. And you ask a Native student what that's about, and they're not going to tell you that what a non-native told you. And so I challenge everyone to figure, figure that out. Um, go to your own community, go to your own families and challenge them because without that, everyone's mindset, they're gonna be the same. These, you know, look, we're looking at tribal elders, um, we're looking at tribal leaders and they've gone on for so long thinking this, having this mentality of, oh, this is gonna stay the same way. No, it doesn't because it's 2020 and we don't deserve to be dehumanized in a way um, that we are right now. You know, these, these women, they're going missing, these girls are going missing and our families are devastated and they don't, there's no humanness to us and it's exhausting to be a student and to be an indigenous person, to battle against your own family, and then to battle against an institution that wants to tell you no, that wants to tell you that you can't take down that statue because it means something else, because it means something else. But you know, ask me, ask me what, uh, what I think of that statue and I will tell you that it is not okay. I want you to take down the statue. That is, um, that's it. Um, but in uh, uh, all that, I encourage everyone to tell, tell someone, no, that's not okay. That's not healthy. Um, and be the change, you know, that's, that's a huge statement, but 
that little resistance is going to matter to the next person. And so I just encourage everyone to challenge them. Challenge your cousin, challenge your mama, challenge your grandma, you know, challenge, challenge your professor because no, because no one is, you may be the first person to do that. Um, and so that's what I want to leave with. You may be the first person to do that. And so be that person. But oh, well, there you have it, folks. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Native Narrative. The future is Indigenous, everyone. Thank you to Jessica Frazier for hosting this topic. Um, thank you to Dr. King. And thank you to Sam Phillips for joining in. Thank you for sharing your time and your voice because you are powerful. Um, so thank you for joining us today on our episode of How Misrepresentation of Mascots Can Impact Our Education and Our Indigenous Identity. Please tune in in two weeks for our next episode. Thank you, everyone. And take care. Wanishi. Mado. Yakoki. Mado. Yakoki. Mado. Weebo. Ahihet. Mado. Hilamaya. Wado.